Welcome to Burst, the ASCAP podcast. I'm Eric Philbrook. And I'm Aton Rosenblum. Like many of you, we are both home. I'm in New York. I'm in California. And through the wonders of technology, we're finding new ways of doing things. Yeah, like how to entertain a three-year-old when both you and your partner are trying to work from home full-time. Good luck with that. I'm trying to tell my teenager to socially distance himself in the prime of his high school life. It's not going well. (laughs) So, coming up on the podcast today, we'll hear from singer-songwriter Jaron Johnson from the Cadillac 3, a great American rock band from Nashville who have just released a fantastic new album called Country Fuzz, full of kick-ass songs that celebrate Southern living. ASCAP's very own Evan Musto, who serves our songwriter community in Music City, sat down with Jaron a few weeks back to do the interview. She's quite the expert on Jaron, too, since she is married to him and is the mother to their very cool young son, Jude. She knows all the right questions to ask. We should let you know that Jaron and Evan recorded their interview before Nashville was hit hard by a tornado and before the world was hit hard by the coronavirus. And like so many artists, Jaron and the Cadillac 3 had to cancel the rest of their tour and head home to isolate themselves. I called him up for a follow-up conversation in light of these recent events to find out how he, his fellow songwriters, and Music City are holding up under these circumstances. You'll hear that after Jaron's interview with Evan. On behalf of all of us here at ASCAP, I want to thank all of you music creators who are stepping up to face this crisis with your great spirit, compassion, and creativity. So many of you are lifting the hopes of millions of people around the world by taking to social media to share your heart, soul, and music, and coming up with super creative ways to do it. Long after this crisis has passed, the world will remember how your music carried us through these challenging days. There are so many great examples. Chris Martin of Coldplay played a whole set from his living room using the hashtag Together at Home. Chris Thiele, host of NPR's Live From Here, launched the hashtag Live From Home and invited so many in the music community to share their music with the world. Right, and then there's uh, DJ D-Nice, an absolute legend of a DJ who spun at a bunch of ASCAP events in the past. He started a virtual dance party called Club Quarantine on Instagram Live that a lot of you probably tuned into. And if you haven't heard that I Marquis remix of Cardi B's coronavirus rant on Instagram, download it now. It's hilarious, and apparently all of the proceeds are going to coronavirus relief. So a little bit of comic relief from two members of the ASCAP family. Cool. You know, clearly our members' music is helping a lot of people out right now. So ASCAP wants to support you however we can. That's why we put together this website, Music Unites Us, with resources to help make sure you stay healthy, creative, connected, and financially stable. And you can go to ASCAP.com slash music unites us and you'll find instructions on how to keep your ASCAP royalties flowing, financial assistance programs to help you out, some amazing free resources from our member benefits partners to help support your well-being, and a bunch of educational resources to keep you creative while you're holed up at home. We know this is hard for all of us, but I think we're already seeing some very positive outcomes. We are reconnecting with our families and our community. We are reducing travel, which is helpful to the environment, and we are realizing we are all in this together and have to work together to get through this. And I think for a lot of us, this is also an opportunity to reconnect with ourselves and rediscover what's truly important to us. Do you mean binge-watching old sitcoms and color-coding your sock drawer? (laughs) If that's your thing, Eric, yeah. Well, whatever you're doing with your valuable time, we appreciate you listening to Versed. Now, let's get on with the show. Born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, Grammy-nominated songwriter and producer Jaron Johnson has lived a life surrounded by music. He got his start playing drums at a very young age, and when he was 13, his dad bought him his first guitar. Influenced by diverse artists such as Nirvana, Leonard Skinner, and Tom Petty, Johnson began to explore the craft of writing songs in his teens and is now lucky enough to call it a career. Jaron celebrated his first number one song with You Gonna Fly, recorded by Keith Urban, and has had other cuts with Urban, including the number one single, Raise Em Up. His list of hit singles include Jake Owen's Beachin', Days of Gold, an American Country Love Song, Billy Currington's Don't It, Tim McGraw's Meanwhile Back at Mama's and Southern Girl, Frankie Ballard's Sunshine and Whiskey, and It All Started with a Beer, and Drake White's Live in the Dream. In addition to being a diverse songwriter with singles and album cuts in the rock, pop, and country genres, Jaron is also the primary writer and lead singer for his band, The Cadillac 3. When Jaron isn't on the road with his band or writing songs, he's also a highly sought-after producer. He has recently produced singles and albums for Steven Tyler, Dirks Bentley, 
Hannah Dasher, Kaylee Bannon, Muscadine Bloodline, and many more. Jaron recently sat down for a special interview with his wife, ASCAP's very own Evan Musto, who serves as Director of Membership in Nashville. Here's their conversation. Hi, Jaron. Hi, Evan. Good morning for the second time. Good morning. <laughs> um, thanks for coming to ASCAP to do this podcast today. Thank you for having me. You made good breakfast for Jude. I did. He was eating it as we were leaving. We're married. Yeah, we are. Very. Happily. Um, happily married. <laughs> um, okay, let's do this. What is it you want to talk to me about? <laughs> we're going to talk about music, honey. What else do we talk about most of the time? Okay. That's pretty much it, right? That's our life. Um, all right, so you love music. It's your number one thing other than number three thing. family, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, your love of music runs deep. Um, you can't write and play music the way you do without having some form of transformational exposure at, at a young age. So tell, I know the answer to this question, but tell everybody when did music first get under your skin? Um, I think, you know, growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, born and raised, my dad was you know, pretty heavily involved in music at an, as I was, a, you know, small child, um, always playing drums, went from, you know, having record deals and all that stuff, moving to town, pregnant with me to play at the Grand Ole Opry and then also even pitching songs down to Music Row, um, which seeing that as a young kid was really neat and as part of it sucked me in and part of it made me rebel or want to rebel and not do that kind of thing. Um, and then Nirvana and um, Rage Against the Machine and, Stuff like that hit Tom Petty, Leonard Skinner, and it made me start to learn how to play guitar after learning how to play drum, the drums for years um, from Dad, um, and just kind of spreading my whole thing. I think, I think the biggest thing when I was influenced the most is you know, being thirteen and fourteen years old and seeing that Seattle thing happen. And Nashville was completely nothing like that. Nashville was all Garth Brooks and Glenn Black and Keith Whitley and Laurie Morgan and, you know, things like that. And so I was like, eh, that's not cool. You know what I mean? This is cool. And so you, then you go do this thing. But then having that country background for all those years um, kind of also unknowingly influenced me as well. I think it's, it's interesting. So it's kind of a little bit of a salad of both of those things, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it's interesting because when I met you, yeah, you were in a rock band, mm -hmm. and now you're in a country band. So well, it's well, country rock. It's debatable. Band. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so let's talk about country music now, as opposed to all those things you were just talking about old school Nashville old school country um, it embraces a much wider spectrum of influences now it sounds like pop bluegrass rock and roll sometimes so what do you think has contributed to the blurring of the genre I mean I think country's kind of always been that way it's you know even back when it was you know Waylon and Hank and all those guys each one of those guys they kind of they had their own take on a movement you know I mean each one of those added their own thing to that thing whether it was willie doing the nasally texas thing you know or um hank coming down off the mountain and being crazy and all and, and that was a thing i think now you have people that have you know i look up to people like eric church and who a lot of these guys that are good friends of ours but also kind of paved the way for at least what what i do um in in our band um you know eric kind of made it okay for a band to be a little heavier on country radio um yeah. maybe not be the cookie cutter right down the middle situation um but i think at the same time sam hunt also a good friend did the same thing for the other side of it you know what i mean like he's he went so far pop and still made it work so it's like it both of those guys are completely different ends of the spectrum but kind of widen the genre at both ends and i think that's what's neat about country music right now is there's and basically always the way it's been, there's always, there's room for so many different ways of doing it. And, um, you know, country music, there's always going to be songs about trucks. There's always going to be songs about girls. There's always going to be that thing that, that hooks you at the end that twists the lyric that a lot of most pop songs and rock songs don't do. And yeah, I think that's kind of, sure. it, it, whether you're taking that from an outlaw perspective or a more pop country perspective, uh, I think that's, that's what's cool about country music is it's all kind of accepted right now. 
Cool. I feel like I need a cocktail because usually when we're talking about music, it's like over yeah. booze. This is yeah, weird. It's nine in the morning, honey. I know, but Bloody Mary <laughs> would be nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about your band. You're in a band called the Cadillac Three. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about how you met Kelby and Neil. Um, actually went to high school right down the street there. You know it because every time we pass it, I point it out to you. Uh, at Hume Fog with Kelby, and we were 14 when we met. Neil was at Hillsborough right down the street. Kind of a rival school-ish, if there was one. And magnet schools don't really have rivals, but I well, I know, but he, yeah, Hillsborough <laughs> wasn't a magnet. Anyways, um, Kelby and I were in a bunch of different music programs together, and also kind of ran around together with uh, a couple of groups. Neil was also in a band, and you know, we were partying together as kids. You know, smoking that first joint together, whatever, drinking beers, and dating a lot of the same girls or whatever it is, and uh, we just kind of like. We're all in separate bands through high school, and then when we got out of high school, kind of all did the same thing, touring or whatever, and then all those things just kind of fizzled out at the same exact time, and I had been writing some songs, and I played them for Neil, who was working at Smoothie King, which is funny, Um, and he was like, man, we should get some people together and try to do it, and so we started playing together, and I mean, that was in 2004, I think, and it's 2020 now, and we're still doing it on a much bigger level you know it's 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 exciting i just remember getting that first publishing deal after i tried so hard to write songs and make something work in a town like this growing up in this town and i got that first publishing deal offer you remember the day yep and i drove down to smoothie king and me and neil went out back and we we're just high-fiving and hugging and crying and it drinking was, peach slice plus yeah and then you know there's like such a tiny little deal but it was such an in, such a significant moment in the creation of our thing that we built together so it's that's fun this is it was this town has uh, seen a lot of different shades of Neil, Kelby, and Jared. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that brings me to the next question. So you guys have been in, you know, been playing music for 15 or 16 years. So um, the band now is doing well and thriving. Tell us about some of the early years. It wasn't always so pretty, huh? We started a band in 2004-ish, 2000, late 2004, early 2005. Um, probably 2004 uh called bang 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 and we were in town and we literally started playing by playing one show invited a lawyer kent marcus down who's still my lawyer to this day to mercy lounge eight off eight with they have eight bands you play three songs and we we kind of kicked ass on accident we i mean we didn't know have any idea what we were doing we were playing these songs that i had written and it rocked it was good and it was its own sounding thing and so after that night, we got all fired up because the lawyer comes back and it's like, man, this is great. I want to work with you guys. And we're like, okay, cool. So the next morning, we all get up and we put on all black, buy all the spray glue, and print out these huge, like, massive <laughs> posters. Massive posters. Yeah, they were It says, uh, who, I still don't know how who is, all are we afforded that. I don't either. Who is bang, 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 or whatever. It said bang, 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 or whatever. Just that's all it said. And we put them all over town very illegally. Like it was guerrilla shit, man. You know, it was, it was cool. Uh, and we, in the meantime, we got the spray glue is crazy, by the way. We all got spray glue in our hands and our eyes and our hair. And it was there for weeks. <laughs> you couldn't get it out because it, it wouldn't just wash off. Um, that's a different story. But... Um, we we did all that and we kind of created a buzz in the town and we were also getting better at writing songs and stuff like that and then so that was the beginning of like the first th- thing of you know Cadillac I guess um, and we started touring in a van and it sucked for years and signed a record deal with Warner Brothers and that sucked um, no no you know no no disrespect to those people but it was really hard it was hard times and. Um, 2010 we got out of that deal they dropped us after spending millions of dollars on a record that (laughs) came out it's a good record yeah it's a good record but uh yeah and then now we started Cadillac in 2011 and never looked back so it's it's been good um so before Cadillac 3 was signed to Big Machine um you were growing your career as a songwriter Mm -hmm. you kind of discovered that you could do that as well um you had had songs recorded by Keith Tim Jake um as someone whose heart lay in playing music with your band how does it feel or how did it feel to have this like other life like as a songwriter the songwriting thing like when that happened when I started getting some um songs recorded by country artists 
that was my biggest thing. Like, like I really cared about that. Um, more because I wanted that so bad from an early age. I can since I remember Dad pitching songs when I really got into writing songs, and started to figure out that math equation that is Nashville songwriting and the whole game. I think when that started happening, I was just like, "Wow, this is really great!" And it was just an added bonus to something that I was trying to build with the band. You know, like it was it was one of those things that made the band thing when the times in the band sucked ass when it was really hard and terrible. I had this other thing, songwriting, going on to where, and I was making money. And so it was, I mean, the hardest thing about being in a band is being broke all the time and sleeping on floors and in a van and being away from your family. So if you 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 have at least one thing to look at, you know, besides the obvious things of having you and whatever, you know, back then, it was it made it a lot easier for me to cope and deal with being out there and hurting on the road, you know. No, um, you had this other thing. Like right, be, having the songwriting. And then when, you know, when the songwriting thing really started to take off, you know, that was really right right around the time when I, I got to be rebirthed, so, so to speak, when we got out of that Warner Brothers deal and started uh, the Cadillac thing. And, you know, Cadillac from the beginning, man, we our first tour was Leonard Skinner and ZZ Top, you know. So it's we jumped right into it you know what I mean and from the beginning it felt successful and different and cool and at the same time I was having a lot of success at songwriting so it was a very cool time so both those things kind of leaned on each other and honestly the Cadillac thing helped me get a lot of cuts on in the songwriting world because everybody thought like you know Dirks or who are these guys are like oh man that shit is cool you know so it was a really cool thing that kind of just time time wise worked out so well it's kind of like best of both worlds a little bit yes exactly when did you first feel the taste of success with Cadillac? And how do you measure success with your band? Like, is it hitting the top of the charts or having a great tour or, you know, having fun with Neil and there, Kelby? What is there's it? There's three things that for Cadillac that I, I think all, I, all three of us would say we would say this was the time that we all looked at each other and we made it. You know what I mean? I think the first one was um, 2013 we went and picked out our first bus down in Texas. We were in Austin, and we'd been, you're talking about three guys that had been touring. I mean, me, I'd been touring since I was 18, you know, literally since I was 18, in a van. Conversion van, it's terrible. Big van, it didn't matter. It's, it's, all, it's all bad when you do it for that long. And so we picked out our first bus, and the three of us were kind of walking through it, and we were just so giddy, you know, and I remember getting on that bus and for the first night ride and you know it's midnight and we're all getting on there I mean we were up to probably five in the morning just looking around giggling man you know it was like kids in a candy store that night that was a big one um and I think uh the first time we went to the UK and we landed and we go to our show and we'd heard it was sold out but we didn't realize that it was going to be that crazy like we couldn't even get into the building couldn't even get out of the building because there were so many people and it was just so packed in there that was a moment where we were all backstage once we finally got in there we were like wow this is incredible um in a whole different country and it felt like we were doing something that like tom petty and the heartbreakers had done or whoever you know um there was that moment and then the night we headlined and sold out the Ryman for the first time that was a big one it was a big one yeah and I had my son there and you you know which was really cool and I, he was a little blob but so he didn't he go to the show on but, the bus yeah, yeah he was on the bus but <laughs> I'm sure he enjoyed it so with any career there's endless choices business related and creative have you ever made a decision that went against what your gut told you and if so, what did you learn from that? Yeah. Oh, I mean, some of them I can't <laughs> even talk about really because of business situations that, you know, you don't want to be, make enemies with anybody. But I I definitely regret um, hiring people that I've hired over the past, you know, 20 years. I think there's a couple that I'd go back and would change that. Um, I regret signing that first Warner Brothers deal definitely in LA just I mean those people don't even work there anymore so it's no big deal but like that thing was such a uh, stunt of growth and life for like four years you know what I mean it was just really hard so it's like I I regret that one I wish that Bang 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 would have an American Bang would have just gone and kind of been a band and then signed when it made sense kind of like we did with Cadillac but all that being said maybe Cadillac 
in my life wouldn't, wouldn't be as happened, good yeah. as it is, and I wouldn't have been as pissed off enough to write that first Cadillac record if all that hadn't have been so bad. So, I don't know. Maybe I don't regret that. That's tough. <laughs> Um, so what does a good songwriting session look like to you for, you know, a well, lot I hope of people I'm about don't... to see one here in about 20 minutes uh, yeah. with a couple of guys, but, um, most people don't know, you know, sit in a room. Right. I even all the time you come home and I'm like, so tell me, what is it like? And I work, you know, with songwriters. It's still hard to imagine what it's like in the room. So just it's kind of different. step by step, what happens it is How's different it go? every day. Um, you know, like usually if it's at my house and I've got all my studio stuff and I'm doing the track or whatever. I mean, sometimes people will come in and be like, yesterday, Dylan Carmichael comes in and me and him and James McNair are writing. It's 11 o'clock. Everybody's got their coffee and a little, you know, a little coffee buzz going. Everybody's excited starting the day out, you know, and Dylan goes, man, I got this thing. Picking up girls and I hit my down Ford. <laughs> And then you just jump right in. And so what's neat about that is those are the good days when you're like, when somebody, especially the artist that you're writing for, and yesterday we were writing for Dylan, he came in and just said that and hit a, hit a one, one chord, D, and James and I were off to the races. And then you're like, you know, brown bag bottle rolling around that floor, you know, and you take it each step and you just write it. And then sometimes you come in with like just a track and there's just, beat thing like if you're writing with more of a track guy and i'll t like i'll top line that you know and i'll be like well i kind of hear this over that you know and it's different every day like sometimes it's really hard and sometimes it's, it's so easy you you're confused you know you, you it's, it's that it's just like wow i can't believe we just wrote that in 45 minutes and then you hear it on the radio six months later and you're like wow that was 45 minutes of worth and it's about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. you know what i mean like it's insane that the stuff that comes out of these tiny little moments but yeah and then sometimes like tom douglas will tell you alan shamblin spends six months on a song house that built me you know what i mean and they just didn't feel like they got it right or somebody like you will make five different demos versions yeah. of the same song over yeah. a span of six months well and the reason i do that is too because sometimes you hear a song it's like it's like man it just never is right but you'd finish the demo and turned it in. And you're like, well, what if I put it over this music or, you know, you know, I don't know. But it's, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing. Like I said, some songwriting sessions are really fun and really exciting and insp inspiring. And some are just like, I just need to get out of this room, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. But the, the, the first one's more often than the, the latter there. So you have a new Cadillac 3 record coming out on February 7th, right? Yeah. Yeah. Look I'm, at you. Well, you know. Looking at the Google Calendar. <laughs> I have that one. Well, it yeah. was supposed to be Valentine's Day. It was. It's changed it, so now that's why I know specifically. Yeah. Um, but it's called Country Fuzz, and so tell tell me and everybody, because I kind of don't even know. Mm -hmm. What does the title mean? What does Country Fuzz mean, and what did you set out to do with this new record? Well, so Country Fuzz came, the, the term or whatever you call it, phrase, um, came from an interview we did in like Germany or I don't know, somewhere in Europe, like probably five years ago. And it was based on the first record. And there, there's some guy says, it's like, it's like quite a country fuzz, right? It's like, it's like a, a country fuzz, isn't it, man? And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's great. And then the other guy that was in the room said, yes, yeah, like Sabbath on cornbread. And I was like, Sabbath on cornbread. That's great. And, but I couldn't, <laughs> you know, you can't monarch your, your, you can't call your band's sound Sabbath on Cornbread, really. You can't own that. You know what I mean? So Country Fuzz we always thought was interesting just because it's country songwriting down to the T. I mean, really swampy southern storytelling, you know, about topics that you pretty much only hear about in, you know, in the South or in the country music genre. But with this angst of uh, like a, a fuzz that you'd hear in a – you know, Rage Against the Machine song or like whatever, you know what I mean? Something to compare that to or something very 90s tone wise, you know, and um, I always thought that was really cool. And we never until this record felt like in between the first record and this record felt like we had something that would make sense to call that. And so this record kind of came out in a way that it really kind of made sense to just call that. And we also started a like a small clothing line at the same time, which is also named that. And it's just kind of, I don't know, it's kind of, it felt fun to finally own own that, you know, and then 
that's where it kind of came from. That's cool. like, like Sabah and Cornbread, man. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember you telling me that. That's hilarious and very accurate. Yeah. Um, so the Cadillac 3's music um, has always been like a celebration of you and where you come from and Kelby and Neil and, and you know, your background. So Tennessee. Yeah. Tennessee. Well, like, how, how does this album honor that or maybe, you know, move on from that too? Yeah, this next record is really interesting because there's aspects of like the first record stuff, like a song called Whiskey and Smoke, Hard Out Here for Country Boys. Obviously, you're very kind of us moments. And then there's songs like Label. There's songs like Heat. There's there's moments where there's songs like Long After Last Call where you hear um, just my wanting to put a real song on there that's you know that to show off some songwriting skills you know, or, you know that's just to get acoustic guitar and a, a vocal um there's some controversial lyrics on there that we've never really kind of dove into which i think is going to be really interesting for people to hear from us um because when you look at a band like us you probably you, you might immediately think the stereotype would be like these guys are extremely this way think this way do whatever these people do but when you hear some of this record you'll probably be like whoa that's a little deeper than I thought it, you know, this yeah. person was capable of thinking. Um, that's about as good as I can explain that without getting into weird stuff. <laughs> but uh, I think this record's going to do a lot of things for our original fans and, and real fans. And I think there's some things in there for new people to jump on board as well. So we kind of wanted to take what we did on the very first record when it was just the three of us and a guy in there hitting the button to record and to just take this one a little bit further because our songwriting skills have gotten a little better and our production skills are getting better. So it's um, it's just a nice little step. Yeah. So you have a couple um, special guests on the album, especially on the new song, mm -hmm. new single. Um, tell us about them and how you got them on board. Um, Hard Out Here for Country Boy has... Um, we were on the road this summer with Charlie Daniels Band and Travis Tripp. We did this three-month run with them just because Travis b became a fan of our band, I guess. And um, I remember getting that call up and saying, hey, they, Travis Tripp wants you to come out and open for him and Charlie Daniels Band for the summer or whatever. And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, that'd be awesome. You know, for our band, that's a pretty cool lineup. And plus, I wanted to see Charlie Daniels Band every night. I wanted to see Travis. And I'm, Travis Tritt is the reason that I kind of sing like I sing. And also, the reason it's okay for a guy to sing like me or like John Fogarty or those kind of people, Drake White, to be in country western music. And so, Travis kind of paved that thing. So, I thought it would be really cool. And so, we went and did that, became really good friends. And one night, he would usually come on our bus at the end of the night after he got done, we'd have a couple of drinks and I was playing him some of the new record and Hard Out Here came on the thing and he's like, man, that is great, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Next day, I can hear him in sound check singing, Hard Out Here for a Country Boy. And so I, I said, man, do you want to sing on it, on the record? And he's like, yeah. So I had him come on the back of the bus in our studio and he sang on it and I recorded it and sent it off. And then Chris Jansen actually called me during that session at some point and i said hey, hey man i gotta take this because we were talking about doing some shows together me and jansen and i said he goes what are you doing man i go well I, you wouldn't believe this but i'm recording uh travis tritt singing on a tc3 thing and he's like what what's it called and i said hard out here for a country boy he goes, i want to sing on it send it to me man i'll sing on it he ain't even heard the damn song <laughs> so i sent it to him and he sent the tracks back the next day and Next thing you know, we had Travis Tritt and Chris Jansen on Hard Out Here for a Country Boy, which is, it's a pretty cool thing, because that sounds like a good old boy anthem, and if you look at our first song that ever came out, The South, it was a good old boy anthem, and we had Florida Georgia Line and Dirks Bentley and Mike on it, so it's like, it's a nice little thing to jump, jump into that every now and then when it makes sense accidentally, because that wasn't planned at all, you know what I mean? It's, there's one thing to be like, oh, we gotta find somebody to be on this. Yeah, putting it together. Yeah, so it, it worked out really nice, it was fun. Um, all right, let's talk about our family and balancing your career and Jude and home mm -hmm. life and all that. Um, so being a full-time traveling musician and songwriter when you're home is hard. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of stuff. Um, so add in a kid. So how do you think, um, we do a good job of balancing work and family life? Well, you have to have a superhuman wife <laughs> slash mom. 
Um, but yeah, it's that's a it's good a, answer. It's a crazy thing. It you know it's a real thing when you 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 you're talking about two hundred shows ish a year, maybe more, maybe less. Um, but if it's less, it's within ten shows of that's that. A lot. You know, yeah. um, and you're talking about producing multiple records, and you're talking about writing two hundred songs a year, if not more than that. And you're talking about doing all those demos as well, for the most part. Um, you're talking about being in a band at home too. Like when we're in Nashville, there's a lot of things that you have to do in town, which it sucks. There's nothing worse than like coming off the road and getting a call from your manager or somebody and saying, Hey, I need you guys to come down to film this thing or whatever, you know, while in my home time, that's tough. And, and you know, when Jude came, it made all those little moments at home so much more important. So it's, you know, it's it's really hard, man. It's there's a reason there's there's a reason a lot of people don't make it and don't stick it out in this thing. And I get it. I get why people would want to be like, now nah, I'm just going to stay home. Um, so I think there's a, a line of like making it work at home. And, and there's also a line of like loving something so much as well that you have to make this work, too. And I have a lot of people that depend like Evan and I have this. We have these conversations a lot, you know, and. Because obviously I could stay home and make a living and be fine. We'd do that. But it's like I have a lot of pen people that depend on me on the road as well for job. I mean, we have a big crew. We have a lot of people that work for us that they need jobs too, you know. And so it's like it's not just as easy as being like, yeah, I'm going to hang it up. That's six people that also would have to have a time of hanging it up and figure out what the hell they're going to do. So that part's interesting too. So you have a lot of things weighing on both sides. And the thing that Kelby and Neil and I have built together from the ground up when everybody else around us has quit or, you know, just couldn't do it is, is so stout and so strong. And I believe in it so much that you, you want to see that thing through as far as you can possibly get it. Jude is having the experience of growing up in all of this, how I grew up, how you grew up. And it's very interesting. Um, he's around lots of music and musicians and we're lucky enough to have him on the road sometimes. So what do you hope he's gaining from that experience? I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't, I remember me being just so like obsessed and thinking everything was so cool going to the opera with my dad or going on a bus with him when he was playing with somebody. And, you know, Jude really won't know, like he came in and when we've had some success so he, all he's going to see is this wonderful, amazing thing. Like, I saw my dad struggle, you know what I mean? And it was hard. Um, so it's going to be interesting. I hope he, you know, he'll be at the house and Keith Urban will be sitting there. You know what I mean? So that's interesting. That wasn't like that at my house. It was like, it was some country star that come, would come over to the house that was delivering a mattress because he couldn't pay the bills. You know what I mean? It was that kind of thing. So it's going to be interesting to see what he reacts if he rebels if he wants to do a heavier kind of thing or if he wants to do like musically speaking too you know um because right now he's really into drums and um i hope he just takes away a positive experience from it and if he wants to jump into that he can um at least i'm glad that we are having success so that he can see how it can be you know but also still he, he can see how it's a little hard sometimes you know what i mean sure yeah i don't know that's an interesting question i know um so I think every musical parent has a list of artists, songs um, that they hope their child embraces, like with the same enthusiasm that mm -hmm. you do, things that you're a fan of or love. I know I do. So what's on your list? Old or what? Anything. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you, yeah. What do you want Jude to love or hope that he's into? The the Tom Petty thing's pretty huge. You know, I think we'd both say that. Um classic things that I know that moved me like the first time I heard them like Beatles White Album um, he loves the Beatles Which we've been listening yeah he to, loves yeah. the Beatles um, I hope he loves everything I've ever done <laughs> <laughs> no I think he you know I'm definitely gonna when he gets old enough and I don't think it'll scare him to death I'm gonna play him Rage Against the Machine because I those riffs and the syncopated lyrics well, he and he loves the, rock and roll yeah I mean. and the big drums the grooves I think he's gonna love that Led Zeppelin I think he would I hope he grabs onto that. And there's certain, like, you know, really cool, like, John Prine, like, country songwriters, or, or just regular John Denver, you know, like, crazy, good J uh, Jackson Brown, the Eagles stuff, 
yeah, I'm, I don't know, big music fan, so I think he's going to love all that. And Tyler Childers. It's his favorite. He loves Tyler Childers. I cannot get him off the Tyler Childers thing. It's, yeah. It's really quite frustrating for a guy who <laughs> is trying to earn his son's love and all the guy that wants to meet. He, he likes just, you, too. He does, he does. He wants to listen to Dada about half as much as Tyler Childers. Yeah, he's into Tyler Childers. All right, well, I guess that's it. Thanks for chatting with me. Welcome, honey. Again, um, I'm ready to go to the beach. We could do it again tonight at the airport. Yeah. Here in a couple hours, <laughs> we will. And we will have drinks then because I'm going to have a mimosa on the plane. Yep, sounds good. Okay. All right, cheers. What a cool couple. For sure. And cool parents too. You know, I've been following Jaron's Instagram feed and he's got a bunch of videos of him and his son Jude jamming at home. And Jude's a surprisingly great drummer for a two-year-old. So check out those videos at Jaron's Instagram handle, at the Jaron. So that interview was recorded a couple of months ago, and the world has obviously changed a lot since then. So I thought it would be good to get on the phone with Jaron and ask him how he's doing in this new world we are living in. Here is our conversation earlier this week. Thanks so much, Jaron, for uh, touching base with us. It's been a couple months since... Uh, we saw you uh, in Nashville before your your uh, record was released and before the world turned upside down. Um, so let's start off on a on a positive note. Congratulations on releasing Country Fuzz on February seventh. Um, uh, you know it was met with uh, some great acclaim. Rolling Stone called the Cadillac Three uh, one of Nashville's m- uh, most uncompromising bands. Uh, which I would think that is a is a compliment. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, it's that was an amazing thing to hear. You know, and not just any magazine say that. That was pretty fun. You know, like having having a little bit of recognition and and we we pride ourselves in that too. So it was pretty cool. Right, and uh, and you know, on a you know even larger than that is to finally release a record that you guys have been working on for a couple years. And I know you kind of stepped up your game. And, uh, you know, was, we're really excited to get this out into the world. Yeah, you know, two and a half years, almost three years um, of work. And it's, you know, that thing coming out and actually, you know, you never really know how it's going to do. You know, you just kind of just put it out there and you hope hope it hope it does something. It's like a baby. You know, you want it to go out of the world and do good things. I think that, um, you know, us seeing all the, the, the critical stuff and, you know, even like a lot of just our friends, the country stars and people that we look up to, that was pretty fun to see everybody kind of react to it. And, you know, getting texts from like TJ and John Osborne saying, guys, great record. You know, you did good. That's pretty fun. Like people that we look up to. And so that's, that's it's a lot of, it's a lot of good things. We're excited. I wish we could, I wish we could go out and play it for people. <laughs> well, hey, well, you got off to a good start. You, you, you guys hit the road. You were in Europe. Um, uh, t- you know, tell me how the tour was going before, uh, you know, you had to kind of pull the plug. Yeah, I mean, it was insane, man. We did, you know, we did probably 12 headlining shows here in the States. All except for one were sold out, and that one was like two tickets away. And if I'd have known it was that close, I would have just bought the other tickets. Um, <laughs> but that was that was a lot of fun in the States. And then we went to Europe and did four headlining shows. Um, we did Berlin, um, Stockholm, Oslo. And one other one, I can't remember. And then we did Berlin with the C2C to C to C Festival. Uh, and then we did Amsterdam. Oh, wow. Amsterdam. And that was kind of like right when uh, everything was getting really crazy. And, you know, you started noticing people not wanting to shake hands and that kind of thing. But it, it, the shows were great, though. It was Everybody was in really good spirits, and everybody seems to be really digging the record. It's just weird times. Yeah, yeah. Well, before, uh, before we uh, get to the coronavirus uh you know stuff uh you know a tornado hit nashville you were you were on the road you know what was it like to be you know far away when when you know all the people you care about and you love uh were you know experiencing this crazy natural disaster it was weird man i was on the bus uh, it was in the middle of the night um it was like more like five or six in the morning there and i was still dealing with jet lag so i'd wake up at like 4 a.m and that's when it was kind of starting up around in, in Nashville, and my wife was texting me back and forth, Evan, and she was just like, "This is getting weird." She's like, "This, this is actually people are really scared." And then I get the text, and she says, "Oh my God, the basement east is not there anymore," and stuff like that. And you just, and me being that far away, and obviously worried about 
my wife and child who are here. Um, then you're thinking about, uh, they're saying it's hitting East Nashville really hard. And I grew up in East Nashville, born and raised over there. And um, it's it's painful. And you feel really helpless. I mean, for me, definitely, I, was, I felt so helpless. Just being there, could not be able to do anything, you know. And then you open up the Instagram feeds and all the news feeds and you see all the devastation. And I was there when the one hit when I was in high school and literally driving home from Human Fog downtown, uh, down to East Nashville along the um, the Cumberland River going to my house. And I could see it in the rear view of my Ford Ranger. I could see the tornado. And they say, don't, don't ever run from a tornado or whatever. I I'd put the I put the damn pedal down and I ran from a tornado. <laughs> and I got home and, you know, it was crazy. So, I mean, being through one, you know, as, as little as that was, and then actually seeing this now, it's just, oh, it's awful. Yeah. Um, I mean, almost immediately, uh, you know, th- there were images of, of the community, the community coming out to help each other. You know, so many musicians and songwriters who, who obviously take, you know, are a large part of that community were out in the streets helping people, helping neighbors. Um, as, you know, someone who's grew up in Nashville, you probably knew the resiliency of your, of your uh, you know, your neighbors there and how they would step up like this. Um so uh you know being on the road you know there was there, there have been so many uh cancellations tour cancellations and and you know what was it like to have to make that decision um to get off the road when you did well just being that far away from the house when all this stuff was going on and then you throw a tornado in there too and it's you know the back half of that little run over there when we were in Europe we were heading to London and I remember being on the ferry from um, where, like Dover to London, and just thinking, "This is the bottom's going to fall out, or it could fall out really quickly, and we could be we could be stuck over here in a weird way." And um, I remember watching the news conferences and all this stuff, and you know, being scared of what you know our government was going to do, seeing what Italy was doing at the time, and all that stuff, and. And I, I remember seeing Trump talk at like three in the morning our time, stay it up. And I got on the phone with our manager and our tour manager and everybody. And I said, hey, I want to play these shows, but I don't see this happening. We should go ahead and get in front of this and at least book us flights for tomorrow. And, you know, worst case scenario, we, we have flights on the next Monday. But uh, this way, we at least are able to get home if we need to and and honestly, at that point too, you're not as thinking as much about the shows as you're thinking about safety of, uh, you know, and also the, of the band and crew, and also wanting to get home to my wife and kid because I'm scared. You know what I mean? And so I think that it was a pretty easy decision when you look at it like that. You know, it's it's bigger than than a band or a business or anything like that. It's it's get home at that point. So uh, it must feel good to be home uh, with Evan and uh, Jude. Um, you know, one of the one of the nice things about all of the, all of this is that you know people are home with their families and people they care about, and they have all this time on their hands that they didn't expect to have. So, how are you? How are you taking advantage of being you know being home and being in your in, in with your family? I mean, for the first like six days, we didn't do anything except just be with each other and hang out. You know, uh, just you know, this is a different moment in time for I mean everybody, but. For me specifically, I, I mean, I've been touring since I was 19. I'm 39 years old, and I haven't been home this long unless it's Christmas in, you know, 10, 12 years, literally, maybe even longer than that. So it's it's a really cool thing for, obviously, a terrible situation. But, like, I think, I, at least for me and my family, we've kind of taken it and been like, wow, we get to actually just be each other and be with each other and get to know you know, I get to hang out with my kid for more than four days a week, you know, so it's, and my wife, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting thing, it's, it's a reset, it's a cool, you know, creatively speaking too, like, you know, I come down here to the studio and been writing a lot by myself, and it's, it's a lot of fun, you know, just to kind of get away from the world, I mean, I haven't really left the house other than to go get a bag of ice at the, at the little market down the street in, you know, 10 days, so it's, it's pretty wild, you know. Right. Um, have you tried your hand at uh, cooking or, or oh, doing yeah. some other thing that you've ne- you haven't really had time to do? Oh man, I I'm telling you, I cook Jude breakfast and and lunch and dinner every day, and obviously with the help of my wife, she's she's a really good cook, and I'm not, but I can make the hell out of some eggs and you know <laughs> stuff like that. So I think it's 
it's been neat to get to just do that and get creative with making Jude's meals is pretty fun because he looks at it and he's just like, oh, this macaroni looks different. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's been fun, though. Uh, cool. So have you been able to, uh, you know, maintain any, uh, you know, co-writing sessions, any songwriting sessions? Uh, um, have you been able to kind of like get into that mode during this time? Yeah, I'm actually starting back for real tomorrow. Um, I'm going to write with Jake Owen tomorrow morning on the, the Skype thing or whatever. There's a new program called Zoom, I guess, um, that we're going to use. And um, I'm doing two tomorrow. I'll probably do three or four next week. You know, I'm not like going crazy with it just because I don't want to lose this the special thing of this little moment you know like I think that's what's important you know people look at this a lot of them as a bad thing and it is but it's also a time to just I mean when's the next time the government's going to tell you to stay home and and just be w with your family you know what I mean like when's the next time that might not ever happen again in our life it's never happened in my life like I said I'm 39 so these are very extra extraordinary times, so I would take advantage of the good parts of it. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah, anytime our country has gone through challenging times, a lot of great music has come out of that. So hopefully, uh, we'll hear a lot, you know, a lot more great music out of you and your and your and your uh, your your c comrades in uh, music. Um, you know, uh, I know it might be a little too early to to kind of let people know, like you know when you're going to get to go back out there and share your music again. But um, how should people, uh, you know, just kind of like keep in touch with you and, and see see what, what's happening with the Cadillac 3? Well, as of now, everything's, you know, being rescheduled, quote unquote. I think, um, and that's and that's just for lack of us knowing what the hell's going on. You know, so I think to in, in, in real terms and, you know, realistically speaking, I would say we're going to be off the road for a while. You know, I, I think... Even if they come back around and say that we're starting back up and everybody's going back to work and all this stuff, it's going to be a minute for us to feel, you know, you know, like I don't want to go play Chicago or somewhere, anywhere, and be responsible for getting a thousand, two thousand kids sick. Nobody wants to do that. So I, you know, I, I, we're going to go when it's safe, and when it's safe, we'll we'll be back out there, and and that's all on our socials. It's the Cadillac Three. You can find us all over the internet. Um, so. You'll, you'll know. When we're back, you'll know. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks again, Jaron. Uh, give our best to Evan and Jude, and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you, Eric. Talk to you soon, man. Just a reminder to all of you music creators out there, if you have questions and concerns about the coronavirus as it relates to your music career, go to ascap.com forward slash music unites us for important information and resources. And thanks to everyone who helped out with this episode, Evan Musto and Jaron Johnson for sharing their love for each other and for the music. Thanks to the Midnight Hours, Adrian Young and Ali Shahid Muhammad for our theme music, Benjamin Keynes of SightSense Productions for audio and video editing, Rachel Choi for graphic design, Sarah Feingold for keeping our eye on the ball, and Kay Cordova for her social media skills. If you'd like to check out our show notes and listen to some of the music mentioned on today's show, visit ascap.com slash burst. And finally, thanks for listening. Remember, music unites us, so keep the music flowing, and we'll see you back here next time.